Naeem, thank you very much for reading that. We will come back to that in just a few minutes' time. You might like to mark it and keep it there. Thank you very much for coming this lunchtime to look at our question, hasn't Christianity done more harm than good? Um, I hope in a second to show you why I think that passage is important to help us, though at least it does uh, contain a religiously motivated execution, um, which is the kind of thing that a book like Christopher Hitchens' book or uh, one of those says is typical or inevitable of religion. On the, um, the sheet you were given on the back of that, you'll see an outline of where we're going. I hope to help us see what we're, we're saying this morning. And you'll see my first point is that there is an undeniable equation, which is that Christian plus power equals harm. If you take a Christian and give them power, they will cause harm. And there are long years of history in which that is obviously true, in which Christians have caused suffering and have done uh, suffering, have caused suffering in the name of their gods. Um, Recent local history, of course, is all about paedophile priests, uh, including those in the denomination that St. Helens here belongs to uh, and in parts of the country not so far from here. And any attempt to reduce the awfulness of that horror or to shift the blame for it is to open the door for it all to happen again. Uh, So I am um, pleased that the two organizations who at first treated paedophilia as a kind of uniquely church problem, uh, that's the media and politicians, I'm pleased that in recent weeks they're having to face up to the reality of it in their own ranks too. Um, But I'm pleased because it means that children are better protected, not because it minimizes the guilt of an abusive priest. So that sort of thing is clear and obvious. Christopher Hitchens, though, he he talks most about political harm caused by Christians, of which um, I think that is a picture of the Crusades uh, on your card. That's perhaps the best known example. It happened to be my further subject during my degree. Um, So my, um, my tutor would be very happy uh, it would make him very happy if you were to come and ask me questions about the Crusades afterwards. Um, I don't plan to focus on them hugely now, because I wonder if something closer to home might be more useful. So I want to talk a little bit about um, what maybe we don't talk about very much, about recent British religious wars, um, by which I mean the British Empire. Um, I went to the National Portrait Gallery recently and asked to be shown the people who made the empire. And I think it was probably the first time the guide had been asked that question in quite a long time. She had to think very hard about where they were. Um, But it is very recent history, isn't it? I went to Africa for the first time uh, in the autumn, and a friend of mine took me to see his grandfather's grave. And his granddad, quite recently, his granddad was district commissioner of a whole slab of East Africa. And uh, where was he buried? He was buried next to a perfect replica of an English village church. Um, Somehow they'd even managed to create the damp inside on the equator, which was pretty stunning. Um, I think we forget when it comes to our recent history how religious it was. Uh, In the National Portrait Gallery, they show you to a room dominated by a picture of Queen Victoria. And it's Queen Victoria and a bowing African. And what is she giving him? She's giving him the Bible. Uh, The picture is titled, The Secret of England's Greatness, the Bible. And in the same room, they have a a long glass cage full of Anglican bishops. Um, Not actually their portraits, because there'd just be too many photos of them. And the connection is very deeply uh, and strongly made. These were deeply religious people. They thought that their God was on their side, and they did some unspeakable things. Religion poisons everything, says Christopher Hitchens. So please understand that in everything I'm going to say today, there is no defense of evil actions, uh, nor of the people who carried them out, nor am I planning to try and minimize the significant ongoing suffering caused by things done in the past. Um, For example, I'm certainly not going to try and make a list of all the good things done by Christians Um, I hope that anybody who's come this lunchtime might be generous enough to admit that there are some, but I don't think that even a heap 
of good things does anything to balance out the harm? You know, how many soup kitchens cancels out some sexual abuse? Don't think you can do that. The equation is undeniable. Christian plus power equals harm. And that equation is true of any Christian, including this one. I'm standing here in front of you. You take any Christian and give him or her some power, you will find them causing harm. So, for example, if you go to the arenas where I have a modest degree of power over my children, uh, for instance, or um, here where I lead a team of those employed by the church, um, I am not abusive, I hope, um, but you will find me causing harm. Days when I um, stay too late at work rather than going home to see my children and help my wife, causes harm. And days when I shout at my children, when really I'm venting my feelings about something else entirely, or um, whole weeks where I don't reply to my colleagues' emails, or I don't help them do their jobs, or I don't help develop them for the future. Christian plus power equals harm, and that includes me. But what I want to do this lunchtime is ask whether that equation is too simple and whether the relationship there may not be causal. And I guess you understand that from the business world. You can have a statistical relationship, a correlation, that is not causal. X does not cause Y. Christian plus power may equal harm, but is it the Christianity causing the harm? See, when I went to the the National Gallery, um, I went round and I I stared at their eyes. It was a kind of foolish thing to do, really. Um, But the question in my head was, can you see the evil? Can you see something in them? Can you see it in their eyes? Can you see they were evil people? So one floor up from Queen Victoria, you have um, a whole bunch of characters on the wall. You've got um, Wolf on one wall who conquered Canada. got Clive on the opposite wall who conquered India, both in the same year, 1757. That was quite a year. But they, they both just look like blokes, just like ordinary blokes. They could be the, the doorman at Lloyd's. They could be your father. And uh, mixed in with them, just hung on the walls around them, was William Wilberforce, whose Christianity led him to a, a lifelong campaign to end the slave trade, looked just the same. And Hannah Moore, whose Christianity led her to campaign for reforms for the poor, or Robert Rakes, who started Sunday schools so the poor could learn to read and write. And they, they all just look like people. It's more complex than Christianity causes harm, because it, in some people it seems to inspire them to do good. And I, I'm again, I'm not trying to balance the harm and the good, just asking what is it that causes the harm? See, that complexity, the complexity there is why um, Richard Dawkins, a biologist, spends tens of pages in his book, The God Delusion, talking about 20th century history. I don't know if you've read it and noticed that. It's a strange thing for a biologist to do, really. Um, Why does he do that? He does it because he's very keen to shift the blame for Hitler and Stalin's killings of millions away from atheism. Uh, He wants to say that it's not atheism that causes harm. It was them. Or even say maybe they were religious. Uh, And he tries to argue they weren't atheists, which isn't that straightforward a thing to do. And it still leaves you with Mao and Pol Pot and a whole host of other less famous figures. I want to suggest actually he's wasting his time, really. Um, And so would I be uh, if I tried to, to kind of try and prove some of these people in the past they're not kind of proper Christians in some way. I want to suggest a completely different equation to you. Um, Why is it that before the 20th century, you mainly find religious people causing harm, and in the 20th century, you mainly find non-religious people causing harm? I think that is because before the 20th century, most people were religious. And in the 20th century, for the first time really, powerful people were not religious. And we'll see where this century goes. It may be, as you watch the news at the moment, you think maybe that was a a brief moment. And actually, some of the people powerful and causing harm now are religious again. But you see, here's where I want to go in point two. I think the causal link is deeper and more disturbing and more profound. It's not that Christian plus power equals harm, though that is true. It is that anyone 
plus power equals harm. And the Bible is very, very realistic about the depth and breadth of the human capacity for evil. Um, it's also, I think, the easiest Christian claim to check. You just need to open the newspapers or um, spend some time paying attention to the people who have power over you. Um, I guess most of us do, do that quite a lot, don't we? And it's very easy to check the Christian claim. Certainly take any Bible character you like and you'll see an honest stare at their failings. Um, and it's in fact most true of the most famous So take King David, for example, maybe the most famous Old Testament character. Um, He saw a married woman in the shower, got her pregnant, and then had her husband killed after he uh, failed to carry up, cover up the pregnancy. It's all all the kind of there in that this is what people are like. The Apostle Peter, um, probably the most significant character in the New Testament in many ways, so confident that he would die with Jesus, who then betrays him in total abject failure. Can't even admit to knowing Jesus when asked by a young servant. So certainly Christian plus power equals harm. Personally, I think the church made a very big mistake one sunny morning in 300 AD when the Roman emperor offered them loads of power. I think the better answer would have been, Constantine, thank you so much, but you're all right. Uh, You can keep it. And I'm very glad that today when people hear, hear that I'm a vicar, and um, they think vicar of Dibley rather than some sort of power figure. I think it's not healthy for Christians to have power. But the Bible says, really, the problem there is because Christians are humans. And any human plus power equals harm. And religious people may be able to be evil in specifically religious ways, maybe. Think hypocrisy or self-righteousness, things like that. But there doesn't actually seem to be anything unique or worse, about the scale, the scope, or the motives. See, actually, part of what we're saying is just it it is hugely complicated trying to do good. I think maybe the the British Empire is maybe an example of that again. Maybe if the um, colonialism taught us that invasion and conquest was harmful. Well, more recently, we've had a go at invasion without conquest. Let's invade and then give the country back. Uh, which isn't going terribly well in Iraq. Uh, And then most recently had a go at refusing to invade and hoping things get better, which is not going very well in Syria. And all of those conflicts are in places where religion and land and money and oil and race and any number of uh, normal human conditions collide to make harm-free solutions just very, very difficult because their place is full of human beings. And the Bible certainly does not try and excuse religious people. If Jesus had one group of people he criticized more than anybody else, it was religious hypocrites, who he said, said they were like tombs. In other words, they're kind of painted white on the outside and look really good, but inside they are full of rotting filth. And, but the Bible claims that that problem... Uh, the tendency to selfishness and greed and harm causing claims that it is general. I think the Bible there is just simply very realistic. It's the easiest Christian claim to prove, but it is also, I know, the hardest to accept. I was uh, really struck a few years ago, I read an account uh, by a man who was a translator on the Nuremberg trials. So he translated for the Nazis as they were held to account for some of the worst crimes in human history. And he wrote up a conversation he had with Rudolf Hess, who was the commandant at Auschwitz. And he asked him, weren't you ever tempted to enrich yourself from the possessions of the inmates coming into your camp? In other words, why didn't you take their money before enslaving them and then gassing them to death? And Hess flashed right back what sort of a man do you think I am? Isn't that astonishing? Uh, Even with his back catalogue as he was in prison on trial for those things, all of us, if we're honest, we have a tendency to see evil elsewhere in other people and not see it in ourselves. Which is one reason why I asked for those verses from Luke to be read earlier. I wonder, could you turn back there if you haven't got it open, page 1065... 
page 1065 in the, the left hand column on that page and in those verses Jesus is dying on a cross and Luke records the conversation he has with the two men that he is executed with and I think it is crystal clear why Luke is interested in those two men it's because criminal number two the one who speaks from verse 40 onwards he is a model Christian his response to Jesus is the response that Luke wants everybody to have. And I hope you can see that's an important thing to look at for our topic this lunchtime. It's important for the question of whether Christianity causes harm to know what a Christian is. Here is Luke's definition, Jesus' definition of what a good Christian is. And it is a death row criminal who recognizes his guilt. That's a Christian makes quite a big difference, I think, to realise what Christianity is really for. I may be very angry with my mobile phone company for not dry cleaning my suit, but that is not what Vodafone is for, and I'd be an idiot. And here's the definition of a Christian again, a death row criminal who recognises his guilt. And just let Luke show you that, verse uh, number 40. He tells his mate to fear God since they are under the same sentence of condemnation as Jesus. In other words, they are on death row and they are about to meet their maker. And he is afraid. And he's more than afraid. Verse 41, here's the thing that hardly anyone says in all the prisons in the world or all the city tribunals in the world or all the FIFA disciplinary hearings in the World Cup. Verse 41, we indeed justly. For we are receiving the due rewards of our deeds. Again, isn't that an astonishing thing to say? I deserve death row. I, I'm going to meet God in an hour or so, he's saying, condemned for what I've done wrong. And I fear him, and I know that's right. See, Jesus never claimed that he was starting a, a movement for good people. Uh, of course it's right to ask how Christians live their lives and make judgments about Christianity on that basis. I'm not saying that's an unfair thing to do. But please at least get right what Jesus is claiming he's doing. See, actually, I think um, one of the best ways you could answer today's question is to get to know a Christian and watch them to see how they use their power and their ability to harm or not. And I think you would see a trail of evil and harm as you follow them around. Uh, alongside, I hope, any good that they, they do. But before you begin that experiment following them around, Jesus would want you to know what he is trying to do. Christianity, Christianity is not for good people. It is for bad people. This man here in the verses, he's a, a good example of a good Christian, the death row criminal. And um, One aim of being a Christian is to make them better, um, but this death row executed criminal fits right in in Christianity. Jesus says, verse 53, today you'll be with me in paradise. So a Christian is someone who starts with a recognition that they are bad, they are a harm causer, and that they want Jesus to begin work in changing them. And the, the challenge, I hope, of our, our topic today and of the, um, the Empire Room in the National Portrait Gallery is that they look just like us because they are just like us. And nobody has ever asked me to govern half of East Africa, and praise God they haven't, because if I governed East Africa the way that I govern 73 Victoria Park Road or the way I govern my desk in EC3A, then we would have a lot of problems. Not because I'm a Christian, uh, maybe even you'd admit that um, being a Christian helps me try and do less harm than I would have done otherwise. Not because I'm a Christian, but because I'm a human. And so are you. And actually, it's very easy, isn't it, to see um, maybe anger against bankers or anger against footballers uh, is largely displacement activity. I feel angry about them because it makes me feel better about myself. Um, the challenge for me is to see the evil in others and recognize its echo in my heart as well. That's what the Bible would call maturity or wisdom. So one, it's undeniable that Christians cause harm. But two, I suggest that's really because they're human, uh, not because they're Christian. 
And then finally, can we look at my third point? I want to suggest one exception. This is the, um, the reason I wanted to bring you to Luke 23, is because in Luke 23, we have a person, we have a human being, who doesn't fit our equations. We have someone plus power, and it equals love and self-sacrifice. Jesus plus power equals love and self-sacrifice. And I think to, to feel the force of it, you need to read some of the backstory. I hope you might be willing to get a hold of Luke's gospel and read some of the, the backstory behind this, because I think sometimes we think of Jesus as a very weak man, as a sort of stereotypical wet Englishman in a nighty. He'd look a bit like this, and he'd say, be nice to people, or something like that. And that is not why they are executing him. You don't execute people like that, or I hope not. Um, that's not why they're executing him. You can actually, I think, you can hear some of the nervousness in what they shout at him. Things like verse 37. If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Jesus is known for his miracles. And that even if you think somehow every single one of those was faked, which I think would be hard to do, he's also known for his popularity with the crowd, with the mob. They wanted to make him king. Only a week before this, he could have had this city if he'd wanted it. Uh, The mob was on his side. They wanted to make him king. Jesus is feared by the authorities as a potential revolutionary. Point being, Jesus used his power to put himself on the cross. Uh, That's clear in Luke's gospel from chapter 9 onwards. That's where he's going, where he wants to go. This death that we've read about is where this powerful man wanted to be. Uh, Even the night before his arrest, he could have walked away. He's in a garden outside the city, and he's waiting for his betrayer to come and arrest him, and he's praying for the strength to go to the cross and sacrifice himself, which is not usual behavior from the powerful. Um, It's not normal behavior from a human being. And actually, his... His integrity comes through here as well. He, um, he taught a good game about forgiveness and turning the other cheek, but surely like any other religious hypocrite, that won't stand up to a real road test. Just look at verse 34. When they actually come to kill him, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they, they mock him for not using his power to come down off the cross and save himself three times in these verses. But the point made by the second criminal story is that Jesus has to stay on the cross so that he can save other people. Why don't you come down off the cross and save yourself? Because he has to stay there in order to save other people, bad people, harm-causing people. Jesus plus power equals love, even for the very worst and self-sacrifice such that he dies their death on their behalf, taking their guilt and their punishment. I'm going to close here. I've got three closing observations. Then I hope over lunch um, anyone who wants to would come and ask me any questions or that we could talk further about this. Three closing observations. One, it is better, safer, to judge Christianity on him rather than on us. Um, I hope you can see that isn't just special pleading. Christianity is for bad people, not good people. Uh, Inconsistency, hypocrisy, harm are to be expected everywhere. Jesus predicts them everywhere in Christians. But it would be fatal for Christianity if you could find them in him. Uh, Judge him, not us. See what you think. Second observation, test Christianity by its founder's definition of what it's for. Um, He didn't actually come to earth to make us good despite what the Christmas carol says. He came to earth to make us rescued. Jesus would want you to test his movement based on how many harmers, how many evil people Christianity has won forgiveness for from the Father. It's a very different thing. You may even think that's an irresponsible thing for Jesus to want to do. You may even think that is a cause of harm. These Christians, they know they're forgiven, so off they are causing harm. Third observation, please would you consider Christianity on the basis that we, all of us, uh, are harmers of others 
who will one day meet our maker and face our condemnation. And Jesus offers the only way out of that sentence. The only way out of my guilt is Jesus taking it for me. And actually, I found that is also the only true motivation to be good and do good. Um, You can see the criminal. He he recognizes his guilt. He asks for forgiveness. He also recognizes Jesus as his king. Um, The reason I try not to cause harm is because he forgave me, sacrificed himself for me, and is my king. What if those would be good basis for investigation of Christianity? Thank you very much for being here this lunchtime. Um, Lunch is just over there. Please, can we keep talking about these things?